The most common contributor to maternal death is the one that is underestimated and overlooked. And it is not hemorrhage, it is not hypertension, it is not sepsis. If you can guess it right, it is anemia. And many of you who will just see that it is anemia will just leave this video because anemia is always underrated. Anemia is to go into battle without recruiting an army and to put your patient in jeopardy is a crime of war because Hemoglobin delivers oxygen to tissues. The uterus needs oxygen to contract. If it doesn't contract, you will go into labor dystocia and prolongation of labor, I said it before, is directly proportional to all maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. And then you have the postpartum hemorrhage, primary or secondary during the per period. And you have some involution of the uterus. So this is all because the uterus did not contract properly because there was no oxygen to contract. Tissues need oxygen to heal when they are injured. And healing, if it is deficient healing because there is no oxygen, you will find that there is wound dehiscence, episiotomy gapping, um, abdominal wound gapping, and even poor healing of a cesarean section scar. And this will precipitate uterine rupture next pregnancy. Tissues need oxygen to stay healthy. Now, if there is no oxygen, these, these tissues are more liable for infection, which is chorioamnionitis, purpural sepsis, and purpural infections. And then you get a patient who is coming in labor with hemoglobin 7, you will give blood transfusion. If there is a shock listing event, you will give blood transfusion. How many units do you need? This depends on the patient's hemoglobin. So more blood transfusion means more complications of transfusion. Considering shock, a listing event, which is our main objective in this channel, is to fight for maternal lives. You have lost many grounds before you even start the battle. Because the pre-shock phase will be very short, and then the patient will go into a hypoxia and will escalate very quickly with the occurrence of acidosis. And to make it further crystal clear, we have the delivery of oxygen goes into two phases. A central phase when we extract oxygen from the air and hand it to the blood. And from the blood, the hemoglobin takes it to the tissue. So oxygen delivery depends on the hemoglobin percentage. And then in pregnancy, we know that there is reduced pulmonary reserve. So patients cannot deal efficiently with hypoxia or even they cannot wash out carbon dioxide efficiently in cases of acidosis. And on the other hand, peripherally, we have hemodilution. We lead to that the patient cannot handle hypoxia efficiently. And to make it more clear even, I want to tell you that one gram hemoglobin, one gram, will deliver 1.25 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters uh, blood flow. While if you increase the pressure oxygen from 100 millimeters mercury to 200 millimeters mercury, all you increase is 0.1 milliliters per 100 milliliter of blood flow. If you want to improve oxygenation in a patient, the best thing is to maintain the hemoglobin percent. So going into labor without recruiting sufficient army of hemoglobin and RBCs means that you are depriving the woman from the pre-shock phase. The pre-shock phase is a phase where there is no tissue hypoxia and they, there is just a shock listening event and the woman is fighting and she can stay in this phase a while before going into hypoxia and inadequate tissue perfusion and she can stay here a while before she goes into the acidosis and acidosis means end organ dysfunction. So these are the three phases of shock and they will, we always say that these phases overlap and they are unpredictable. I think they are predictable because if you have it's a balance between the compensation of the patient and the health of the patient versus the severity of the shock listing event. So if they are balanced, we are compensated. If the shock listing event becomes more than the compensation, then this is inadequate perfusion and this is the decompensated phase. And if acidosis sets in, then the large spheres of hypoxia and acidosis, and they will just roll over the patient and flood all the compensation that the patient has. Okay, what if we have a large compensation sphere? Then we will have more compensated phase, pre-shock phase, in order to work and save our patient. And it will be difficult for the shock listing event and for the shock to overcome the compensatory mechanisms of a healthy patient. So what is anemia? Now hemoglobin percent below 11 
gram percent is anemia. The CDC gives the definition of first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. This is confusing. We just need a cutoff level. The cutoff level is 11 gram percent. The WHO reclassifies anemia into mild, moderate, and severe. If it's below 8.5 gram percent, this is severe anemia. From 8.5 to 10, this is moderate anemia. From 10 to 11, this is mild anemia. And all forms of anemia need to be treated. Anemia is the commonest medical disorder in pregnancy. So that's why it's the commonest contributing factor in all conditions that may lead to maternal mortality. The risk of anemia increases with gestational age. And the WHO, the CDC, the RCOG will tell you that the most common cause of anemia in pregnancy is nutritional. I beg to differ. No, it's not nutritional. Pregnancy itself is the cause of anemia because most reproductive age women have inadequate iron stores because of the menstrual cycle, the monthly menses. So most women don't have stores, don't have enough stores. And when they go into pregnancy, pregnancy needs 1000 milligrams of iron. Now pregnancy, this 1000 milligrams of iron should be provided in the days of pregnancy, which is almost yani, approximately 180 days. Can these needs be met by nutrition? Well, the recommended iron intake for pregnant women is 27 milligrams iron daily. We absorb 10% of what we eat. Now the average diet is not 27 milligrams iron daily. It's 10 to 15 milligrams iron daily. So what we absorb actually, the 10%, will be 1 to 1.5 milligrams per day. So in 280 days, the woman will have gained 280 to 420 milligrams of iron. We need 1000. So we have a deficit in pregnancy, an iron deficit, regardless of nutrition, about 500 to 600 milligrams iron. This cannot be met by diet. You will absorb 1 to 2 milligrams maximum. There is always a deficit. And because of this deficit, the recommendation is that routinely in pregnancy, every pregnant woman should have at least 30 to 60 milligrams elemental iron supplementation in addition to the 400 micrograms folic acid in order to meet the needs in pregnancy. So the cause of anemia in pregnancy is pregnancy itself. It is aggravated by nutritional deficiencies or other diseases or whatever, but the cause is not nutritional only. If you give good nutrition, this doesn't mean that you will not go into anemia. There is always need for supplementation. Before going further into the details of treatment and investigations, we need to have a look at the metabolism of iron. Iron, there is no cell in the body that can synthesize iron. So the only source of iron is through ingestion, either in diet or through medications. There are two forms of iron, the ferric form and the ferrous form. The ferrous form is the one which is absorbed into the enterocytes. The ferric form is the non-heme iron. It is the iron from vegetable sources. And this has to be reduced by reductase enzyme into ferrous iron. Reductase enzyme activity is enhanced by ascorbic acid and hydrochloric acid. So antacids will reduce the absorption of the vegetable source iron, the non-heme iron. And that's why we may give ascorbic acid uh, to enhance the absorption of the non-heme iron, but not the animal source iron, which is heme that is attached to a ferrous iron. This is broken by heme oxygenase 1, and the heme is separated from the ferrous iron. Now the ferrous iron can enter the cells by a divalent metal transport. It's a metal transporter, not iron transporter. So it competes with other metals in order to be absorbed. That's why we don't give calcium and iron uh, together. Now it's inside the enterocyte. Inside the enterocyte, it can be stored as ferritin, as iron storage ferritin. Or it can be transported to the blood through the ferroportin. The ferroportin does two major functions. It will again reoxidize the ferrous to ferric and it will not release it into the bloodstream because the ferric iron molecule is toxic. That's why it has to be handed to the transferrin. When it's handed to transferrin, each one transferrin molecule will take to ferric iron molecule and the transferrin will take the iron to various tissues. One of the tissues is the liver. And in the liver, iron, excess iron, can be stored 
as again ferritin. So iron is stored as ferritin in the enterocytes and in the liver. And it can be released from the liver by the ferroporti. Another source of iron is the recycled iron, which, I, which is the iron in the macrophages. And again, it is stored as ferritin and is released through the ferroporti. This is the gateway through which the iron is released into the circulation. And it will hand it to transferrin in order to be attached to transferrin and not to wander around as a toxic metal inducing toxicity to cells. Because iron is toxic, there must be a negative feedback somewhere. And the feedback is through hepcidine. When the transferrin saturated transferrin iron is increased in the circulation, this stimulates the release of hepcidine. Hepcidine, it's a peptide hormone which comes out of the liver and it inhibits ferroportine. It inhibits enterocytes from releasing the iron into the circulation, it inhibits the hepatocytes from releasing iron into the circulation, and it inhibits the macrophages from releasing its iron, its recycled iron content. The use of the stored iron is inhibited by hepcidine. It cannot be transported to the circulation. But in the enterocytes, there are two mechanisms. It will inhibit the release of iron in the ferritin to the circulation, and it will inhibit the absorption of Iron. So, the investigations that we may go through, first of all, we do CBC. CBC will find that there is microcytic hypochromic anemia, and this means that the hemoglobin is less than 11 gram percent, and the mean corpuscular volume is less than 80 femtoliters. And there is another diagnosis, which is iron deficiency, not iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency. We may do serum iron, and of course, to, to, to measure the serum iron, what we do is that we take a blood sample, and we add a chemical in order to separate iron from the transferrin, because iron is not in the circulation. When we separate it, then we can measure. Now, serum iron, less than 40 micrograms per cent, means that there is iron deficiency, but more Commonly, we do ferritin. When we measure ferritin, this is this correlates very good with the iron stores. So we can now have an idea about the iron stores. But take care that ferritin can increase with any inflammatory uh, process in the body. So it may be false positive. Ferritin, the level in old literature, literature will be if it is less than 12 nanogram per milliliter, then there is deficient iron stores. More recently, another figure was proposed, which is 30 nanograms per milliliter. And with the use of 12 nanograms per milliliter figure, you will have high specificity. Patients who have less than 12 are definitely with deficient stores, so long there is no inflammation. But you may miss 25% of patients who have deficient stores, and the level is above 12. But when you use the 30 nanogram per milliliter, you will have specificity of 98%. So it's specific that patients with ferritin less than 30 nanogram per milliliter do have iron deficiency stores. And you will have high sensitivity. You will not miss patients who have levels between 12 and 30. This will be included as iron uh, deficiency stores. And then another investigations where you can do the unsaturated total iron banding capacity, which obviously will rise in cases of iron deficiency anemia. And then you can measure the transferrin saturation, and the transferrin saturation will decrease. So the binding capacity, the unsaturated increases, the saturated decreases. You can measure levels of HCD and alternative to ferritin, there is the soluble transferrin risk. All lectures are based on Togaville textbook, your one-stop, postgraduate study source, and decision support platform. You have 14-day free full access trial. Follow the link in the description to start your trial. Remember to hit the subscribe button, and if you find this video useful, please like and share. Except clinically, we just need hemoglobin percent and ferritin level. If it's more than 30 nanograms and the hemoglobin is more than 11, then this patient has no iron deficiency and no iron deficiency anemia. Nevertheless, because she is pregnant, she will need supplementation with iron, elemental iron 30 to 60 milligrams plus folic acid 400 micro. If she has hemoglobin more than 11 gram percent and the ferritin is less than 30, this means she has deficient iron. And this patient, in order not to wait till she goes into iron deficiency anemia, we can give more supplementation and 
wait because we will talk about this between brackets. What is more supplementation? Okay, the WHO will say 150 to 200 milligrams elemental iron per day. We will, we have a comment. And then if it's less than 11, and the stores are good, they are more than 30 nanogram per milliliter. This means that this is not iron deficiency anemia. This is another type of anemia. So basically, we can do the mean corpuscular volume if it's megaloblastic anemia or if it's microcytic anemia, but not the iron deficiency anemia. The patient may be thalassemia or something, so we do hemoglobin electrophoresis. But if the hemoglobin percent less than 11 gram percent and the stores are less than 30 nanogram per milliliter, this is iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia treatment can be through number one diet plus iron supplementation. It can be through parenteral iron, intramuscular or intravenous. And it can be through packed RBC transfusion. And this will treat anemia, but will not treat the iron deficiency. So still the patient needs iron and still the patient needs folic acid in all forms of treatment. So if you give iron, you give folic acid with it. Now, when do we use parenteral iron? We use parenteral iron in cases of the patient is not compliant to oral iron, malabsorption syndromes, intolerant, and I have worked in places so poor that patients are given iron tablets from the antenatal care clinic. And what they do, they go to the street pharmacy and they sell this iron for them for few quatches or shillings or pennies in order to buy food. And so I lost the oral route, so I have to give it parenteral or significant anemia, less than 8.5, which is the severe anemia by the WHO definition, less than 8.5 gram percent. So in these forms, don't give oral iron. If the patient is less than 8.5, go for parenteral iron. Transfusion of packed RBCs is indicated. If at any time during the antenatal care, the hemoglobin percent is below or equal to 6 gram percent, this cannot be allowed because the fetus needs oxygen, the mother needs oxygen. So we have to give or to maintain hemoglobin percent, which is enough for the fetus to continue growing and not suffer from hypoxia and fetal growth restriction and to avoid other complications of anemia like abruption and to allow tissues of the mother to be healthy. So no pregnancy is allowed to go on with a very low hemoglobin, which is six or less. But if the hemoglobin percent is eight gram percent or less, and the patient is 34 weeks, we have to give packed RBC transfusion because we cannot allow a patient to go into battle, into labor with a very low hemoglobin. We need to raise this hemoglobin to 11 gram percent. So we will give her at least four units, three units, four units of packed RBCs over the period of three to four weeks. Now, the oral iron therapy. Oral iron therapy depends on ferrous salts because ferrous iron is the one which is absorbed from the enterocytes. So we have ferrous fumarate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous succinate, ferrous sulfate, and ferrous glycine. And the tablet may have 200 milligrams of ferrous fumarate, but the elemental iron is 65 milligrams or 35 milligrams. How much elemental iron is there? Because the guidelines say that you should give, give elemental iron 30 to 60 milligrams per day as supplement and 150 to 200 milligrams per day as treatment. Now, what is the difference between these salts? Well, ferrous sulfate is the commonly used one because it's widely available and it's very low cost. But the best tolerated is ferrous glycinate. The maximal enteral absorption, the absorption of iron, this elemental iron, the patient will not absorb 60 milligrams. Maximum, she will absorb 20 to 30 percent. Average, she will absorb 10 to 15 percent. So out of this elemental iron, you just calculate that she will absorb 10 to 15 percent, which is 6.5 to 9.5 milligrams of this iron. Now, should I increase the dose as the WHO says from one tablet to two tablets? Actually, all, all research work now and literature proved that increasing the dose does not increase the absorption because we have HCT. Even more, giving alternate dose therapy is much better than giving daily therapy because this allows time for hepcidine to recover in order to allow more absorption. So oral iron is not a, a dose related phenomenon. It doesn't work this way. You don't increase the dose. So this means that the woman is taking more iron. No, if you increase the dose, she will still take the same iron 
absorbed from one tablet on alternate days. So you don't, if, if, if you are giving one tablet on, on alternate days and you need more iron, you don't give two tablets. You don't give two tablets daily. You don't give morning and evening. All this is not beneficial for the patient. You have to go to parenteral iron. The intravenous iron preparations, all of them have a core of the ferric iron, not the ferrous iron, because this goes directly to the blood. And it, when it enters the blood, it enters as a sugar coat, carbohydrate coat, and the iron is, in, is inside this coat. Why? Because we said that the ferric molecule is toxic. The toxicity of all forms is related to the stability of the molecule. Because once you give it IV, the macrophages will engulf all this iron that you need. But sometimes it cannot engulf it in time. So some of the iron, if it's not stable, it will leave the core of the carbohydrate shell and the iron will be released into the circulation. And this will induce the infusion reaction. So infusion reactions are related to the stability of the molecule of iron. The high molecular weight dextran was the one which gave the parenteral iron its bad reputation. It's, it's the one with most toxic and adverse anaphylactic uh, events. So it's obsolete. Now we have the low molecular weight dextran, the iron gluconate, and these two have low stability. So this means that we have more toxicity. Even with the toxicity, the, the serious adverse reactions of iron gluconate is 0.9 per million infusions. The pharynget is very stable. The iron sucrose is less stable. And the, there is the iron isomaltoside and the few moxitol. These two I haven't used. But what I have used in my experience, iron sucrose for a, quite a while till pharynget came and was introduced, I think, uh, six or seven years ago, and then I shifted to pharynget. Why? Because with pharynget, the stability allows you to give 1,000 milligrams over 15 minutes. Problem solved. Finish. So 15 minutes, and the patient had regained her stores and can synthesize her hemoglobin percent with no fear of anemia. Of course, this depends on the dose calculation and how to calculate the dose. But, not, but from this slide, I want you to know that the toxicity of parenteral iron has decreased massively by the introduction of the stable iron uh, molecules available for the IV infusions. So, parenteral iron dose calculation, you multiply 2.4 by the pregnancy, pre-pregnancy weight times the hemoglobin deficit, which is, for example, I usually use 12 minus the hemoglobin of the patient. If it's 8, then I need 4. I will multiply by 4 times the uh, pre-pregnancy weight of the patient times 2.4 and then you add 500 for rebuilding the stores. Or simply just multiply the hemoglobin deficit by 150 and add 500. This considered that 150 milligrams of IV iron are needed to raise hemoglobin level by 1 gram. A test dose is no longer recommended because it can deceive you, except for low molecular weight dextran in Canada and US only. But in Europe, it's not recommended. The ferrozac is iron sucrose and the ampoule is 5 milliliters. Each ampoule contains 100 milligrams of ferric elemental iron, okay? In the carbohydrate shell, of course. Now you put two ampoules, which is 200 milligrams in 200 milliliter saline IV infusion over 20 minutes. And you can infuse on alternate days to avoid the rise in FCD. So the patient can utilize the iron that you are giving. So if you need 1000 milligrams, this means that you will give the patient five infusions on alternate days. The pharynget, on the other hand, the ampoule, the ampoule is 10 milliliters and it has 50 milligrams per milliliter, which means that we have 500 milligrams per ampoule. You can use one or two ampoules and dilute in 250 milliliter saline infusion and the infusion can go over 15 minutes. So 15 minutes, you can give the patient 500 up to 1000 milligrams. Don't exceed the maximum dose because if you exceed the maximum dose, this is maximum uh, those related to the research about the macrophage uptake, how much the macrophages can uptake, and how much the transferrin can be saturated. Because if it's already saturated, any excess iron will be released as molecules before the macrophages can 
uptake it. So don't exceed the maximum dose. So in this table, you will find the maximum dose of low molecular weight extract, for example, is 100 milligrams, while the maximum dose for arm sucrose is 100 milligrams per infusion, which is two ampoules into 100 milliliter saline over 20 minutes. And the maximum dose for the pharynject, which is the highly stable IA carboxymal dose, is 1000 milligrams. So this is the idea of the maximum dose. We don't use a test dose, as I said. Instead, we have the 213 European Medicine Agency risk minim minimization measures. As we said, no administration of parenteral iron during pregnancy unless clearly necessary indicated and only in the second or third trimester we don't give it in the first trimester because the three radicals of iron are toxic only administered by staff trained to evaluate and manage anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reactions and there are resuscitation facilities immediately available practice of first giving the patient a test dose is not recommended and it is not reliable so you have to be alert all the time and by the way the slower the infusion rate, the less you will have problems of anaphylaxis. Why? Because the slower the infusion, the more time you are giving to macrophages to engulf the extra or to engulf the medicine you are giving. When you give it slow infusion, like I said, pharyngeal, give it over 15 minutes. You can give it over 30 minutes, much better and much less problems. It's not enteric iron, so it bypasses the intestine. It will go directly into the bloodstream. And the idea is that it will have to be engulfed by macrophages. So don't over flood the macrophages. Give it slowly, so you give time to macrophages to engulf the iron, so the transferrin is not saturated and there are no free radicals which cause the adverse effect. So slow transfusion is very important. It is not used in patients with hypersensitivity to other parental alarms, and it is used very cautiously in patients with atopy, asthma, eczema, anything which is related to hypersensitivity. Now, there is also the intramuscular therapy, but it causes staining and it is painful and it has to be injected through the Z uh, intramuscular injection technique and it is also carboxymal tools. It's ferric carboxymal tools. There are many forms in the market, but this is the form I like. And the way we give it is that we calculate the total dose that the patient needs, we divide it by four, and we give four equal, nearly equal doses one week apart. So intramuscular iron is there uh, to be used as well, but the popular is the intravenous iron, especially after the introduction of the uh, iron carboxymal dose and the recent highly stable forms of iron. Now my advice is antipartum, antipartum. You have to do everything to ensure that the patient goes into labor with good blood volume and good hemoglobin percent. For the blood volume, I always instruct patients to drink a lot of water. Always the patient will ask me, how much should I drink? Well, I tell her, drink water that will lead to that your urine is transparent or light yellow. That's it. When you reach this, this means that this is enough water for you. And the second is that we give air and we use all the weapons that we have to have enough hemoglobin percent by the time we reach birth. In the first trimester, we will rely on diet, iron, and folic acid. And we cannot give parenteral iron, so the only iron we are allowed to give is the oral iron. In severe cases where the hemoglobin is below 6, this is, there is the risk of anemic heart failure. So you have to give packed RBCs until you reach the second trimester. You give packed RBCs to correct the anemia, but you did not correct the deficient iron stores. So we wait for the second trimester. In the second trimester, treatment of iron deficiency anemia will rely on diet and oral iron and folic acid as usual. But if the patient is intolerant to oral iron, then we can give her the parenteral iron to restore the stores of iron. In cases of hemoglobin below 8.5, gram percent then we give parenteral iron even if the patient is tolerant to oral iron and of course when we give parenteral iron we don't need oral iron anymore because we give the total dose plus the 500 stores so you don't need to give oral iron we rely on diet parenteral iron and folic acid but if this is after 34 weeks gestation or intrapartum the patient comes in late 
with hemoglobin less than 8.5 or 8, then we have to add to this treatment that we will give packed RBCs because packed RBCs will correct the anemia but not the deficient iron stores. So you still have to give parenteral iron, you still have to instruct about the diet and to give folic acid. Also in perperium, the same thing. The patient is not allowed to be anemic in perperium. This will lead to secondary postpartum hemorrhage and purple sepsis and subinvolution. So we also correct anemia in the perperium. If it is severe anemia less than 8.5 or 8, we give packed RBCs. Hemoglobin less than 6, second or third trimester, same treatment. We give, we arrange for a better diet. We give the parenteral line, we give folic acid, and we add the blood transfusion. So if the patient, the hemoglobin is six or less in any time in pregnancy, then we have to give packed RBCs. Will you give parenteral iron or oral iron? Depends, first trimester, oral iron, second, third trimester, or perperium, we can give parenteral iron or oral iron. Diet is always there, folic acid is always there. And your goal is always in your mind that it's there, that the patient should not go into labor anemic. You have many weapons, use them. The last slide will be about the reactions and the reactions to, to our infusions are treated the same as transfusion reactions. So you can start with, if it's a mild reaction, you stop the transfusion and you observe. If it's a moderate reaction, you give steroids and if it's anaphylactoid, you will give an nebulizer or a bronchodilator. But if it's a severe reaction, the only treatment is adrenaline. And we said adrenaline, 1 to 1,000 dilution intramuscular, give half and pull. After 10 minutes, patient not, not in good condition and did not recover, you give another half and pull, and you give bronchodilators, steroids, and IV infusion. And if she needs, she may need ICU admission. I hope we fight for maternal lives much more efficiently. We cannot go into battle without recruiting a suitable army. Okay, thank you.